Hello and welcome. My name is Craig Lipset, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session on real world data as a game changer in pharmaceuticals and in drug development. Today, I'm excited to be joined by a panel, of five experts in the field. We're gonna be covering a range of topics from how uh, organizations are um, putting their teams together in order to best leverage diverse real world data and turn that data into real world evidence and actionable insights. We'll be talking a bit about some of the gaps and opportunities people are seeing in the field. We'll share some vision for where this panel feels the field is going, assuming our success in the area. And we'll have time for your questions. And so please make very good use of the Q&A tab on your screen share questions along the way, and we'll be sure to have time at the end to make sure that we're addressing them. My name is Craig Lipset. I'm an independent advisor in the field of clinical trial innovation and on the faculty at the University of Rochester, as well as Rutgers University in the uh, Department of Health Informatics. And it's my pleasure to be joined by this panel who will be representing their views during our session and not necessarily the views of their employers or other affiliations. With that, I would like to introduce each panelist and invite them to share a bit of perspective on how they are making use of real world data in their work today. And to kick things off, I would like to begin by introducing Bernard Hamelin, who is the Global Head of Medical Evidence Generation and Global Development at Sanofi. Bernard, welcome. Thank you, Craig. Thank you for the invitation. It's my pleasure to introduce um, the work that uh, the organization Sanofi has developed over the last couple of years in the field world. So my name is Bernard Hamlin. I'm the global head of medical evidence generation at Sanofi. It's a team in charge of the delivery and the planning of evidence generating through real world data using both conventional descriptive analytics as well as advanced analytics and platforms. The combination of real world data and conventional or advanced analytics is offering great promises uh, for informing development of safe and effective treatments for accelerating also the delivery of clinical trials. The regulatory aspect of these data is still uh, submitted to guidance from FDA and EMA, and we believe that the number of cases where we will be able to use these data to support and uh, to generate new uh, applications will be growing very rapidly after the guidance will be issued later next year. The use of real world data is also extremely important for the access to the personalization of treatment, identifying subgroup of patients that are really responding well with limited side effects of new treatments, as well as differentiating our products. And when you combine a patient level data generated through application or device with real world data, you start to have a really robust way to build models predicting outcomes that are important for physician and patients. <clears throat> However, all these promises have uh, some requirements. You need to really build a new competence in, her, in house required to generate uh, these new evidence and there are a combination of that, them that are required as well as all the issues of rolling out large platforms using advanced analytics in an environment that is traditionally working in the silo mode, research, development, commercial, and access. It's a prerequisite to really understand these challenges if you want to deliver first valid experimental test of intervention and then industrialize them in a much more robust way as well. Thank you, Bernard. I think we're going to have some great conversation here to build upon, whether from a regulatory perspective and any constraints there, a global perspective, and certainly some of these great organizational themes you're bringing up. With that, actually, it's a great segue to introduce Tiffany. Tiff Tiffany McCann is the Vice President and Chief Data and Analytics Officer at Otsuka Pharmaceuticals. Tiffany, welcome. <coughs> Thank you, Craig. It's great to be here. I'm so honored to be part of this, this panel, and it's such an important topic. Um, I, I believe that there's a bit of a, a, a universal understanding that we're seeing there's 
unrealized potential with the use of real world data. And taking that leap from real world data to real world evidence is what my organization has been really focused on. Um, so I took this role a little bit over a year ago when Utica decided to have a centralized data and analytics organization. And when I say centralized, it really is bridging R&D through commercial and even our corporate functions, HR, finance, et cetera. Um, so we really do look across the whole life cycle of the drug compound. And what we've been really primarily using real world data for recently is, is mostly around reimbursement and dossier um, perspectives, but we are going beyond that in recent days and looking at patient journeys, for instance. Um, and that patient journey will allow us to understand feedback loops and understanding the patient's journey will allow us to take that information from a commercial perspective and also help inform our trial designs and our dossiers from that perspective to allow for more optimized commercialization. Um, so there's been a, a lot of effort understanding those feedback loops in my organization and having it centralized has been helpful in, in that respect. A lot there to unpack as we think about both organizing for success, but also how we can best leverage our people and our resources and our know-how across the enterprise and align it against patient journey. Thank you, Tiffany. I'm looking forward to, uh, to talking more. Our next panelist joins us from Merck. Uh, Ravinder Dewan is the Vice President for Outcomes Research in their core oncology. Ravinder, welcome. Well, thanks, Craig, and thanks for the invitation. As uh, uh, Tiffany pointed out, we were obviously honored to be part of this uh, uh, very astute panel. And then, you know, it's uh, great to be here and discussing what one of the key topics and issues that is, uh, you know, near and dear to all of us here and, and gaining a lot of strength in the industry. And I think if you look around, uh, there's an explosion of activity in the real world data generation uh, uh, aspect of in the last 10 years and, and, and then converting that real world data into the real world evidence. So what we typically do as part of the organization that we have within Merck is to to generate the evidence throughout the life cycle of the products. So we start very early on looking at uh, what sort of uh, real, real world evidence is gonna be required and needed in our clinical development program that allows us to address the needs in the different phases of the drug development process. And then simultaneously while we're looking at it, we start to generate the evidence on what is the epidemiology utilizing some of the real world evidence that we can uh, access uh, and start looking at what the uh, disease, uh, the cost of disease and burden of disease would be. That allows us also to do some predictive modeling from an economic modeling standpoint to see where we would land in terms of uh, patient access and, and reimbursement once the drug gets to the market. And then once the drug gets to the market, it's our responsibility within this uh, uh, group to utilize the real world evidence that we generate. Uh, to strengthen the value proposition of our, our products uh, for access at the time of launch. And then once the drug is out there, then there's a whole slew of stakeholders that approach us that they are looking to see how the drug is going to uh, perform in the real world now. So you have stakeholders, typical HTAs and difficult pair, uh, pairs were asking, you know, you showed us that evidence in the clinical trials. Now, how is that drug is going to do that in the real world? So there's a need from that standpoint. So we start thinking about what sort of evidence and what sort of studies that we will need uh, to utilize some of those real world data and evidence. And then, of course, uh, the HCPs are asking more and more that how is the drug going to perform? What are the safety concerns? What are the efficacy concerns? Can we actually replicate all of that in real world? Along with, of course, the patients are asking. You know, we, we saw that promise in the clinical studies what would I face and how would I react and how would I actually utilize some of the outcomes that are promised in the clinical trials. So whole slew of needs that are being generated within the organization. So if you look at that, clinical development folks are asking for real world data, the commercial teams are asking for real world data and commercial teams are actually asking a real time real world data so that they can have information in their hands. What were the patient starts in the last few weeks or, or months? what their utilization patterns are. And of course, then you have uh, folks asking who are patient advocacy groups within the organization, patient uh, folks who are in the policy arena that are 
uh, utilizing some of the real world evidence. So the whole slew of stakeholders, both internally and externally, who are scrambling to get their hands on the real world data. And, and we sort of feel that, you know, we are sitting in that sort of sweet, sweet spot within the organization can bring all different elements together as a, other panelists have alluded to, how do we bring the information technology? How do we bring in all the different elements from medical affairs and, and other uh, parts of the organization to bring forward this? <clears throat> Thank you, Ravinder. And it's, this is a great um, observation as well around the diversity of our panel. Some of our leaders are really thinking about data across the enterprise, across therapeutic areas and different um, functional lines. Uh, some are focused in therapeutic areas. And Krishnan Ramanathan from Novartis joins us as the global program head for neurosciences at Novartis. And so, Krish, I have a feeling you're also bringing a very different lens and perspective on how you're making use of real-world data today. Thank you, Craig. Um, absolutely. And it's a pleasure and uh, an honor to be a part of this panel to um, have a discussion on real-world data. So as uh, Craig mentioned, uh, my name is Krish Ramanathan, working in the uh, Novartis Global Development Group, and I'm a program head uh, for neuroscience. Uh, currently, my responsibility is overseeing a program in multiple sclerosis. So it involves uh, leading a team of people cross-functionally, all the way from uh, the research side through translational medicine, um, safety, medical affairs, market access, it's, uh, it's, should I say, it's a, it's a dream job to work on this because you can really see the impact happening. Uh, we start off with uh, a target profile like probably many of my colleagues do in the industry, right? and that's a sort of a vision for what you'd like to achieve with the product. And um, we're assessed or we, our success is measured on how can we translate that to a reality to get a drug with an approval or a label that matches to what the vision was. And, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an amazing pleasure to see how so many people have to work to get a you know, small vial of liquid or a, a typical white powder through an approval process, right? And it's, I'd say hundreds of people work on a single program. And real world data is something that is adding a lot more meaning to us now. So our job is to, what we say, get an approval with a target profile or, an, or label in an indication that we seek that matches the vision that brings the evidence. And, and also obtain the access in that target population. And sometimes what is, what is needed or what is required to get an approval may not be sufficient to get the access because the, either the standard of care has changed or the evidence needed is going to be more substantial than what we've just demonstrated to get an approval. So we keep looking into how can we incorporate some of the real world data in parallel to the, uh, you know, the discovery and development of a new medicine to bring that to bear to these discussions. I mean, one particular example that I'm really fond of understanding and, and looking at solutions is when you do a cl clinical trial, you look at what a clinical comparator would be, what a comparator that you want to displace from the, shall we say, a treatment pattern or something from a competitive landscape that you say you want to displace and you provide better evidence. And this you choose as a comparator that gets agreed on by the regulators and you try to show demonstrable substantial evidence of improvement in health metrics compared to this. But there's always an indirect comparator, something else that is there that you're compared to in the industry. And at the arrival of an approval, you don't have any data against this comparator that is seen as a pricing comparator or an access comparator. And how do you do an analysis that shows an indirect analysis? And then when you discuss this with statisticians, you get down into little rabbit holes on you can't compare across these trials. So we want to come up with better methodologies and lots of tools are available today, but that's our vision to see if we can do a parallel development to show the data that is required for market access and for practitioners, for clinical practitioners in this. So with that, I hand it back to Craig. Chris, it sounds like a great, very practical example around comparative effectiveness, leveraging real world evidence along the way. Um, Finally, rounding out our panel, I'm, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Terry Bresenham. Terry is the founder of True North Health Advisors and is the former Chief Innovation Officer for GE Healthcare. Terry, welcome. Thank you, Craig, and thanks to Jim for hosting this uh, session, one that obviously makes a huge difference if, if we get this equation right. Um, Hi everyone, I, as, I, as Craig said, I'm the founder of True North Health Advisors, which is working alongside innovators and companies like Indigen 
and uh, on a mission to bring better healthcare solutions to market by developing technologies and new business models and commercial strategies designed to disrupt the status quo. As the former chief innovation officer of G Healthcare, which included our life sciences business, I was focused on investments and strategies uh, and, and leading ed technologies that would be able to disrupt uh, the way we think about the delivery of healthcare. And my experience with real world data um, and many of the panelists have, have spoken to some of the critical points here, but we were looking at how can that drive the decision-making of the on-ground reality for patients and the caregivers and how that everyday healthcare delivery model, as we all know, is never very straightforward. So we tried to use real world data in a sense to uh, be in the context of the way healthcare gets delivered and trying to deliver on that promise of, you know, the right therapy for the right patient at the right time. And we had some uh, amazing experiences with this, some, um, some failings as well. So we can talk a little bit about those. Uh, but clearly everyone believes that if we could have the right amount uh, of data that represents the, all the nuances and permutations that happen in the delivery process, that we can couple the information we know about a therapeutic together with the rest of the clinical picture and drive better decision makings that will lead to better patient outcomes. So Craig, back to you. Thank you so much, Terry. I'd like to start to lean our account, by the way, this was fabulous, both in terms of learning a little bit more about each of you, but also the opportunity to listen and share some of the, um, some of the use cases and the areas that you're uh, working on most actively. Before I jump into a, a, a first question, uh, Ravinder, I was hoping to just elaborate a bit further for our audience. You used a phrase of converting from real world data to real world evidence. And this theme came up with a number of our panelists in the introduction. I'm wondering if you can help our audience to understand what is the distinction that we're describing when today we're talking about real world data versus real world evidence? And how can we help make sure our audience is, is very familiar with some of this different jargon and their differences? Right, so no, thanks for the question. I think the real world data is essentially what we are capturing at the bedside from the patients or, or in the clinics and, and in a routine practice. So if you look at the ACA, which was approved in 2009 uh, in the last administration, when, when it was mandated that every clinician, every clinic, every hospital is gonna to have to uh, collect the data electronically in, in the US. And everybody ran to their next door uh, you know, software companies to start uh, putting together uh, methods to start collecting the data locally. So that led to this explosion of real world data. It is sort of capturing of the data electronically. But in, in all reality, we, we've been collecting the real world data uh, for, for decades. I know we used to have these registries uh, uh, where we would uh, go out and collect patient level data from clinics and, and, and hospitals and institutions. The, the key then is to have you sitting on this data, but how do you develop insights out of that, right? How do you uh, develop those insights which could be informative for your internal and external teams, which could be informative for patients, for informative for uh, clinicians, informative for peers. Uh, and that's where the whole idea of how do you convert the real world data into the evidence, right? So you have to apply different technological advancements, the methods, the statistical methods, uh, the, the methods which are out there, which allow us to play with the real world data now, which you're capturing and applying those uh, techniques to convert into the evidence, which could be meaningful, insightful, simple for stakeholders to utilize in their decision making. So that's the sort of distinction we kind of always say, data is data, but it, it doesn't provide you much if you don't apply those methods to convert that into an evidence, which could be helpful for, for different stakeholders. That's very helpful, Ravinder. Tiffany, you've been organizing um, your company around, I imagine, a lot of this process and pipeline of how do we consume this type of diverse real world data and have a, a process for our entire enterprise to be able to generate evidence and insights. What are the lessons or experiences you can share in terms of organizing at an enterprise level to make this happen? 
Right. Thank you. It, it, it's a great question. And, you know, um, we don't have the perfect answer. We're learning as, as we build um, in, in some respects. But um, I think there was a realization that, you know, there was this untapped potential, as I mentioned earlier, um, and that real world evidence was almost thought of as secondary to submission efforts. And so we took a step back or actually maybe take a step forward and decided to invest in a, an organizational structure that really allowed for dedicated teams to be focusing on that conversion of real world data into real world evidence. And so creating this organization allows a seat at that strategic table as well as creates that bridge between R&D and commercial. And so that is one of the you know, more um, functional ways, structural ways that we try to encourage and, and show an investment in this space, as well as bringing in folks with experience. And it, it is a different mindset than your more traditional um, development uh, talent. And so that there is um, a bit of a gap, I would say, in, in the talent pool there. And that's one of our challenges. People with experience that have that more flexible mindset, it is a bit more creative in, in some respects because this is a new new area. And so um, we've really invested a lot in that space to have dedicated groups to provide a place at the table and make sure that they're at both the R&D table and the commercial table so they can create those feedback loops um, and leverage real world data across the whole life cycle. Tiffany, I imagine that this is a very complex matrix of the, to find the right talent and tools, whether it's the diversity of data you're trying to acquire, the types of tools that are needed to support the analytics and those approaches, the therapeutic areas that you're going after, as well as many of these different use cases. Um, how, do you, how do you best organize and manage around this? Is it, do, you, do you try to leverage um, just central resources that are um, uh, kind of uh, cross-trained? Or do you have a lot of specialists that have to work together across different teams? So we have um, had the opportunity to repurpose some of the existing data, some of the existing tools. A, a great example that we have um, is with COVID. Uh, we were leveraging new data from you know, CDC, Johns Hopkins, but we were leveraging it to answer different questions, right? We had different questions coming from R&D around trial recruitment um, versus questions from commercial around sales reps going back out into the field um, or coming in from the field. And so it, that's a great example of where we were leveraging common data and common data platforms um, to answer questions across that life cycle. And even the platform that we used to bring in that data had been in place um, for our clinical data review. It was our clinical data review tool and it was built years ago. Um, so it was a quick win ultimately, but it was because of years of building and years of effort to put in the right systems that were robust and agile. And we were able to then repurpose that to bring in this new data and, and answer questions across that life cycle. So it, it, is, it can be complex, um, but it, it, it's quite, quite beautiful when you can take a look at, at where you have some successes. Thank you, Tiffany. Bernard, you also had mentioned about uh, operating across organizational silos, especially as it relates to um, data. What are some of the strategies or best practices that you're seeing come to life within Sanofi that are helping you to either leverage talent, repurpose data, repurpose the tools that you're deploying in the organization? Thank you for the question, Craig. Um, we have been engaged in, in developing strategically the use of real world data to support research, commercial and development uh, about four or five years ago. And we started a little bit like Tiffany mentioned, a central team building uh, first a platform uh, with very specific characteristics from, from a traceability security point of view, where we could put our internal data and external data in a combined way but also advanced analytics competence we did not have before. And of course we had the descriptive analytics, conventional analytics already in place. Now this team has worked very efficiently to show the, the potency of these tools to answer questions by combining data, very, very different from what was available before, applied to 
lifecycle management questions, apply to efficiency in the clinical trials, apply to how you measure uh, real-time, real-life, the, the usage of our product. Uh, but the, 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 the company realized that the implementation of the tool in the different product teams during the development phase or in the different commercial teams in the post-marketing phase was much slower than what they had envisioned initially. So we moved from a pure central team, and that's currently what is happening, to what we call a hub and spoke. So we keep centrally the platform, the data, the data governance, some key methodology and standardization necessary to have a com common view around how you manage these data across the company. But then you develop spoke. In the R&D, there are two spoke, one in R and one in D, and the different global business units. Because you want to be as close as possible to answer the what and why question at the team level. And a central team becomes a bottleneck. So the transformation is ongoing. Um, we, I need to wait a little bit to see the impact of this move from a central team to a hub, hub and spoke. But clearly, we see an acceleration of the use of the data at different phases of the company. And we predict that it's only the beginning. Thank you, Bernard. If I, if I could just add to that, I think if you look at what both Bernard and Tiffany were saying, this is a fascinating evolution that's happening in, in, in the industry. And most of the companies are sort of moving into that model because the, with the data explosion, there is a desire to sort of bring more and more data sets into the house so you can address and, and apply different techniques and methods to address the needs of different stakeholders, whether it's commercial development or whatnot. So given that model, what you're seeing is not only that, but we are applying uh, you know, tremendous technology from information technology colleagues to just come together and develop those applications and apps internally, which allows them to utilize the methodologies that Bernard was talking about. That if you have questions coming up, similar questions coming up from different parts of the enterprise, if you have the application and the right methods in the central location, then people can go in, pick the data set they want to look at and apply that and get the answers quickly. So it's just exploring of that activity that's happening. Sounds like an interesting blend of trying to democratize access to information exactly. while at the same time trying to fully leverage the, the limited talent and resources that many of us have that really know how to best work with this data. Tiffany, you were going to add? Yeah, I, I'd like to um, just share how we've addressed that challenge within Utsuka. Um, we've, we've actually taken a bit of a two-prong approach. The one is to have centralized capabilities that can work across R&D and commercial and corporate functions, such as our data technologies team that really looks at the data engineering, data architecture. We also have data stewardship, which is really managing our enterprise data across all of those different domains, R&D, commercial, corporate functions. But on the other side of things, we have our analytics functions, which are domain specific. So they have that domain expertise and so that they can partner really closely to the business, understand the business problems we're trying to address and be able to then leverage the centralized functions more efficiently. Thank you for elaborating, Tiffany. Terry, as, as an active advisor in this space and a former recovering executive in the field, do you have a sense of how either organizations are best organizing themselves uh, in this category, or perhaps where they seem to be struggling in terms of leveraging and repurposing data and talent internally? Well, I think it's, it's a phenomenal question because it's one of the, probably the biggest barriers for success or rapid success, I should say, in the way companies look at this mainly because it's, it's a little bit of what Tiffany was just saying. It's how do you organize this information? How do you, how does the ingestation of the right information get put into the system so that people can actually make, make use of that? The second is it just cuts across a lot of internal boundaries that we've conventionally built or these silos of the way we've been operating. And I think um, to convert this information into things that can be useful, whether that's understanding the, you know, the right uh, cohort of patients that we should do a trial on, whether we can use this for synthetic trial information, um, how does that convert into the way in which a customer ultimately will select which patients will be eligible for this, or insurance providers, uh, you know, uh, providing that cost-effective information. 
But as you think about it, it's a, it is an inevitability and it takes a lot of effort. And I think a lot of trial and error, frankly, uh, Craig, we, we can try to say, here's the things to try to do and in, in setting up your information properly to make sure you curate the data uh, carefully. Uh, I've seen a lot of mistakes just by the fact that, you know, kind of junky data got into the system and then that misled, you know, the decision making. Uh, so I think there's a tremendous amount of uh, things that we could structurally look at and systematically try to set up. But there's a cultural aspect to this, which is companies have to understand how they're going to participate in a team sport of real world data to real world evidence that's quite sometimes quite different than, than what they've been accustomed to. That being said, I think teams that I've watched get, go through this um, metamorphosis almost, once they get that understanding and they, and they have developed some evidence, and um, a great example is a project we did with sepsis. And it was our team having to figure out how to work across these multiple boundaries but it was also working inside the healthcare system where they also had their own uh, institutional boundaries, if you will. But once we got that right and we could actually see how dramatically this was changing the delivery of care, the patient's outcomes, the cost of care, uh, it got people really excited. And I think the, the institutional, um, you know, uh, inertia that was you know, that had to get overcome like a flywheel almost very heavy lift to begin with but once you kind of got it going it, it was more um, self-evident for people why this works so I would encourage anyone it's even if you you know kind of feels very hard or you stumble once or twice uh, it's worth continuing down this path because there's really truly probably the most uh, advantageous ways we can change healthcare is through this mechanism. I think uh, it's such a great point, both around organization and culture and making sure that we're bringing our, our teams along. And Chris, I think about you in that category, because, mm-hmm. you, you know, we've been talking a lot about things at the enterprise level and best organizing our strategies here, but your teams are boots on the ground. They're owning the molecule and, and the development strategies around them and bringing them through to the market. Do your teams kind of feel aligned to this? Or what do you have to do as a leader in the development organization to help set that receptive culture? It's a great question. And and I was going to add to what Terry was just saying that we have to take some risks and uh, implement things because if we just sit aside and watch, uh, I think uh, the real world data will continue to accumulate and uh, you'll continue to be using old practices for doing new trial designs. Um, I mean, one of our challenges is that we are both producers of this data and consumers. So as we do clinical trials, we just produce tons of data. And we need to look into that as well before we go on to say, okay, what is the real world setting out there? And we need to absorb the real world data, be able to design better trials, make it practical, and see if we can bring it to patients faster. So I I think um, being tied to role types and archetypes um, is still a bit of the yesterday's drug development, right? We need to, we are all consumers of data, no matter what our title is, um, even if it has data or data science in it, which, uh, which is attractive to put in the title nowadays, but we are all producers and consumers of data. And we need to realize that and find ways to see how we can connect it. Because if we produce data in our silos, uh, as, as uh, Ravinder mentioned as well, and, and Bernard, you did, that the safety data will sit with the safety team, the omics data will sit with the research team, uh, the medical affairs, uh, real world data collection will sit with that team, but then we'll be doing traditional drug development. So we look at ways to see if we can, one example I mentioned is to see if we can come with the re- evidence at the time of launch. Another is to look at if you're doing either life cycle strategies or specific development, like uh, for example, in high unmet need areas or challenging areas, pediatric designs, for example. Um, is it still ethical to do placebo control study or comparative control or blinded studies here? Is there some way you can bootstrap, you can do a synthetic control arm and, and just do an open label um, uh, you know, query into this population? Um, still challenging, uh, but we managed to make some headway with the regulators in one direction, at least to reduce our sample size substantially to enable us to bring this evidence faster if it so um, merits the benefit. So absolutely, we have to take some risks. We have to go beyond what our job title wants us to do. 
And uh, we need to be conscious of what we generate because if we don't connect it and if we just let it sit in a hard drive, uh, it's not going to be of use. You know, Krish, one, um, one thought based on what you were just sharing is this sense of urgency for all sponsors and drug development teams to bring opportunities forward for the regulators to react. Um, I've found from most teams that I talk to and work with that the regulators are extremely receptive. When I was at Pfizer, we were doing submissions for new indications for existing drugs based on real world evidence. You mentioned a, a great example here. Terry called out about our ability to use potentially synthetic control arms or alternative control arms for our trials. Chris, are you sensing as well that the regulators are receptive as your teams are starting to put together these, these new plans? They are. I, I'd say that um, uh, they have to take a balanced approach here as well. I think they have a responsibility that goes beyond uh, approvals of new medicines to population safety, to maintaining standards that have been put in place over years of uh, understanding of drug development. So to make a leap of faith here to go completely into synthetic controls and real world data would be challenging. So going from there to saying, uh, you know, can you um, use some mixed methods or hybrid models to say where it is really urgent, where it is needed, uh, where it's almost impossible to do new trials to demonstrate evidence, uh, can you then take a bit more risk? And they are willing to um, certainly move in this direction. I, I think as industry members, we always want them to move faster and we urge them to in, in any discussion that we take with them. But I see the importance that uh, many regulators have highlighted this. Um, there is also a churn going on in terms of what talent they bring in and who are the reviewers of this. Um, people who've actually written the guidances 20, 30 years ago um, are, are, are going to be changed soon. And there will be new guidances coming in, but still those guidances are still in play. And as this happens, I think we'll see a lot more innovation coming in. I'm positive. Thank you. Thank you, Krish. And uh, to the audience, please keep your questions coming in. We're starting to see some of them coming through now. And Ravinder, some of the questions are leaning into uh, going back to this, um, this journey from real world data to real world evidence. Um, some people are wondering about the challenges that we all face as we're trying to choose the right analytic tools or other challenges in moving from diverse data coming into our organization to meaningful, actionable evidence and insights. Ravinder, can you elaborate at all in terms of some of the key challenges that you're seeing in that, uh, in that step in the process? No, thanks, I mean, that's a great question. I think one of the key issues there is how do we build that trust? Right? How do we build that confidence among uh, whether they are regulators, whether the payers, other stakeholders, patients, clinicians? How do we build their confidence in the uh, real world data that we are utilizing to generate that evidence? Right. So, so it all starts with having the right data, and I think one of the key challenges that we continue to face, even though we've made tremendous strides, and I think the evolution that has occurred in the last ten years or so has been phenomenal in the in the data world. Um, but we continue to face those challenges in terms of the quality of the data, the completeness of the data. Uh, that's, uh, that still continues to sort of bog us down in some ways. Um, we've got enormous uh, disparity in terms of uh, the data collectors who are utilizing those techniques of curation. I think Terry talked about the data curation processes. We still think, think that some of the regulators and, and payers and stakeholders look at that and they think that the whole curation process is just like a black box. We don't know. Everyone is trying to apply their own algorithms to sort of dig into that unstructured data that we typically get and come up with some insights that could be applicable. So, you know, to just that situation. So we don't have the standardization from that standpoint, what methods are we applying? We don't have standardization in terms of what algorithms we are utilizing to sort of get insights out of the real world data. And you know we we're jumping very heavily into applying uh, artificial intelligence and and uh, NLP techniques into the data sets to develop that. And we've made great strides. Uh, we we need a lot of validation in that area to sort of how do we which one of those um, artificial intelligence techniques are applicable in which situation. 
which data sets. So I think those are some of the uh, some of the issues that we continue to face, uh, particularly on the quality side of it, and how do we enhance the quality over time? That would help us enhance the confidence in the data set that we are utilizing to um, generate those real world evidence. I think that is something that we're going to have to work on vigorously across party lines here, across all different sort of stakeholders, across industry to raise that confidence. If we think that we're going to be utilizing this that uh, data to a certain extent with our regulators and payers. That certainly sounds like a bipartisan issue. And so from a challenge perspective, Terry, you were sharing around culture uh, being a key challenge for vendor. You were elaborating more about um, trust and confidence in the diversity of data that we may have coming in. Bernard, what types of challenges do we face or, or how are you managing as it relates to choosing the right um, investigational tools? What types of analytics approaches do you and your organization need to bring to bear across this diverse data? Can you allow me maybe to comment first on what Javier just said? Because I believe that it is in the field of data. I'll, I'll comment and answer your questions, but it Absolutely. is in the field of data where we have the most important gaps. Let, let, me, let me explain. There are usage of real world data that are non debated, provided that we have the right level of quality of data regarding uh, understanding burden of disease, usage of the treatments we, are, we want to measure, or safety measure. They are already included in, in regulatory procedures, and we use them quite commonly in, in also in market access discussion to measure uh, our commitments post approval. Where it becomes complicated is when you have data on disease that have uh, that are meant for research purpose, so pre-approval, don't have products on the market that really mirror what you're looking for, and therefore the quality of the data with the right biomarker becomes research-grade data, what I call, and they are kind of really complicated to find. And the other issue we face, a very practical issue, we have had adopted the strategy initially at Sennefi to combine a lot of data we can acquire with high quality creation on our platform. Uh, but in reality, the majority of the data will never be available on our platform. We need to work with federated data where the data stays in the hospital. We just move our tools to the hospital to run the analytics there and to consolidate aggregated results at the sample team. And, and the technology here uh, of federation, federated analysis is something that we are looking very carefully. There are different methods used. We think that is something that we, we needs to be validated. The validation process is sometimes takes a bit of time to check that is really meeting the expectations from uh, internal stakeholders, but also external uh, like policymakers or regulators. But we think that in this process of acquiring the right data fit for purpose, for regulatory purpose or scientific purpose, or for using data at the point of care and not moving the data to a central database, we have here two very important topics the community needs to really be addressing. Tiffany, are you sensing um, the same? Are you looking at opportunities around federated data approaches that can enable perhaps uh, more access to diverse data than what you may otherwise be able to bring into the organization? Yes, that has been part of um, our data scouting strategy. Um, we are also working very closely with a number of data aggregators. Um, they're able to do things within um, you know, the PHI and PII considerations outside of our walls and then um, through you know, different blinding approaches and, and um, anonymization, then we can receive those data. And so that, that has helped in a lot of ways. Um, but I would agree that you know, the fact that we don't have consistent structures, we don't have consistent standards, that, that is a challenge. And I think just fundamentally from a, a privacy perspective, inconsistent formats, um, incomplete data, We've made some advances, um, technological advances, analytics advances with machine learning or um, natural language processing with unstructured data, but we have a long way to go before we can really leverage the data um, more holistically. And so we are using smaller data sets than I think we could. There's a lot more data available. 
um, these days than you know five years ago. Um, the other challenge that we're seeing though is is with bias, right? So I mean, there's bias or com possible confounding with the way real world data is collected, and so that that is an inherent challenge with real world data. So there's you know a compound effect. Um, with using real world data. And, and again, we have been making numerous advances technologically as well as with uh, analytics approaches. So, you know, the, the future is bright, um, but that doesn't um, mean we don't have those challenges today. Thank you, Tiffany. Chris, we have a question coming in about the feedback loop for real world evidence coming back into development organizations and how do development organizations today manage when perhaps some of the real world evidence that starts to come in looks different from their assumptions that they had made, whether around development planning or even what it looked like from some of their earliest clinical studies. We know that sometimes things don't look the same and as we broaden out to perhaps uh, different patient populations on the real world data side, how do you see um, people in the organization in the trenches on development teams managing when they get data in like that? Oh, that's a great question. You know, often enough when we um, have an approval and we've some say sort of completed a development process, uh, the buck doesn't stop there. So we have a commitment, uh, including to regulators to collect real world data and to show demonstrate safety because these approvals come with certain commitments to either close some gaps or to answer some really poignant questions on the academic side of what is the safety in a larger population. And, uh, and we have a responsibility to collect, to analyze this, and then look at the match to what was obtained in the clinical trials in a very you know, uh, synthetic population of uh, prescribed patients of who would fit into these criteria. We try to be as general as possible because you know, we um, obviously are driven by also commercial interest to make a label as wide and prevalent and important as possible. But at the same time, we want to do in a test population, which is homogeneous. So it's two edged sword. We try to look at this. I'd say that on the efficacy side, often we, we hit a good point because we are looking at a single metric or a couple of metrics to say that, you know, these are what are the criteria that is important for showing that this uh, medicine is working in this population. And, and the real world data often is quite closely matching this. The challenge comes on the safety side when you open it up to a larger population. How do you look at this data? How do you uh, look at this and say, is it an event we could have predicted? Is it something that is related to the drug? Is it something that is unrelated? Uh, is it even true in some cases? Is there a coding issue with some of these? So we look at it with, uh, shall I say, all pairs of eyes that we can in the organization. We have safety teams pouring through it and we apply a lot of uh, modern technologies that we can as well to sieve the data in terms of uh, artificial intelligence or to categorize it and then to look at uh, uh, predetermined risks. Um, and the feedback comes in very quickly. I can only say that, but it's a responsibility that we take seriously and need to make sure that uh, we are closely matching and anything that may generate a label change needs to go back to the regulators. Harry, we have an additional question here uh, that goes a little further around the regulators. Do you mind to add uh, oh, absolutely. Add one thing to Chris said? I, in I, in I, any I, debate in America today, you're allowed to answer my question <laughs> with whatever and, last topic. And interrupt here. the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> no, please um, go ahead. So one of the other things I think it's really uh, important to appreciate is how many of the user communities or academic centers are building their own set of data analytics yeah. on the evidence. In particular, I would say around adverse events. So I think it's, it's gonna be this interesting um, coupling of which the, the drug manufacturers are obviously doing the right things. But I would say the users community is now getting uh, more robust and their abilities to collect this information across a spectrum of what the care continuum is for a patient and already starting to drive uh, you know machine learning or deep learning into this process for which they're going to come back and say listen we think it's uh, this subset of population with these genetic markers or or other uh, conditions that may be uh, not appropriate so I think the, the, the interaction now. It almost goes back to that um, 
comment from Bernard and Tiffany earlier around federated data models, but this is really also federated analytic models where you might have this just distributed world where different institutions are doing their own analytics and how do we roll up those insights? Right. Especially, you know, countries where they're big building uh, very deep uh, genetic and genomic databases on their patient populations. I think these are going to be very important as far as the way we think about the future of um, immunotherapies, for example. And I think that's where, that's where some of the points that Chris was also raising earlier, that once the drug is out there, you know, that we have the obligation to collect the right safety data and, and bring it back and, and provide that for the public safety. And that obligation, we take it very seriously. We do all the data dredging and, and bring those insights. But I think the point that you, the question that you earlier also asked, it relates with the effectiveness data as well. So how do the development teams, once the clinical trial has been completed and the drug has been approved, you know, there are certain endpoints that have been proven in, in that sort of constrained environment of the clinical study that has been submitted for to the regulators. Now we go out and do a real world study with all different caveats and biases and we start to demonstrate slightly different sort of effectiveness in the world. And, and it's, it's, it's a very difficult situation for the development teams to sort of look at that and absorb that because now you're seeing different results. And, 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 and that's, that's a, quite a bit of a debate that occurs with the, with the clinical and development teams, with the now real world evidence generation teams and what you're trying to do and what you're seeing. And so we need to be really careful which jurisdiction you're applying, what kind of study you're doing, what kind of cohort identification process was employed, what sort of inclusion exclusion criteria was employed in the real world to get to that. And that's where, again, it's all kind of tied up, you know, in the sense that what data set did you use, the robustness of the quality of the data to get to those insights. So I think it's a really great question that how do you sort of once you develop these real world insights in the, uh, by either by yourself or there are other sort of parties in, in, in the field who actually uh, go on and do that for you. And, and then how do you manage that with the development team now you start to see them in different results. Thank you, Ravinder. Bernard, we have another question in the audience that builds on some of the conversations we've been having around regulators. And I'm wondering if you have any perspective on how regulators a regulatory view has been evolving in recent years, in particular, perhaps adding a global perspective. Sometimes we, where I sit, may get a little myopic with enthusiasm around the FDA, but are we able to see um, certain trends happening across regulators around the world? I think we need to distinguish what is uh, data that are pivotal to get a new indication or a new product or in this, uh, a product that is already on the market from supportive data. And, and it makes a big difference in terms of what you can put on your label or not. If you have uh, pivotal uh, data of efficacy and safety, there are very limited ex uh, day products that have been approved in the US and in Europe uh, using real world data. And primarily in the rare disease field or in the very specific oncology subgroups where the RCT is really very difficult to justify. But if you look at from a supportive point of view, either on the safety side or also on the population, on the dosing and other aspects of the label, there's a growing interest to continuously update the label with the information we get once the drug is on the market. Hence, the agencies are now organized to have, uh, if you take Europe, in the scientific advice, you have a real world expert. But you can ask questions regarding the appropriate use for instance, I was looking at Chris. Uh, in one of our programs, we have a very complicated control arm to build. We are trying to combine uh, real patients in the randomization with a, a, a larger proportion of real world data. So, combining real world, real patients that you randomize with real world data in a control arm in a randomized way is a very new approach that we take risk. Uh, that is currently under uh, uh, discussion with both agencies. But it really shows that there is an appetite for dialogue, both in Europe and in the US. And uh, China has issued earlier this year in the, in the spring, their guidance around what they would think appropriate for 
uh, real world data, and they are very much in tune with what US and Europe are, are building today in terms of expectations of quality of data and methods. Thank you, Bernard. In our final moments together, I'd like to do a little bit of a, of a lightning round and invite all of our panelists to be futurists. And let's assume that these uh, challenges that we're describing, we've crushed it and we've got this humming in our organizations. What will development or commercialization of new medicines, how will that look different over the next five to 10 years, given our success in our real world data and real world evidence efforts? Terry, can I invite you to perhaps uh, put the futurist hat on first? Sure. I think that all the, just on macro level, all medicine will be practiced with decision support systems behind it. So every decision and processes behind the way we care for patients will be augmented with machine learning, deep learning, and possibly AI. Um, I think part of that will be the fact that we'll understand the right treatment at the right time for the right patient in a different way than we do today. And based on all the discussions we just had, Further, I think my hope is that the development cycle is shortened because we can take advantage of real world data, converting that into synthetic trials, uh, better cohort selections, ways in which the patient population for that drug will shrink, but the likelihood for its success and its cost effectiveness in the field will be uh, better understood. And if we can shorten that development cycle, the cost equation will, or the, the business model will work. So I think that's, that's a little bit of what I see. I think the whole idea around data sharing and federated learning, as well as the, the access to uh, more pervasive data like genomics and, and proteomics, where we have obviously much more patient uh, privacy concerns, but I think those will be more and more prevalent in the way we think about the care of patients and the development of the treatments for those patients. Um, so I think those things, those three things would be the way I think the future of how data will ultimately change and disrupt the way we think about care today. Thank you, Terry. Ravinder, can, um, what is your 30 to 40 second, your elevator for, uh, sure. future, futurist lens? Look, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great optimist on that front. I think the strides we've made have been tremendous in the past few years and will continue on the same path. Technology is kind of doubling itself. It used to double every 10 years. Now it's five years or three years now. So my optimism there is that I think we'll be in a, in a spot where all the genomics data, as, as Terry was pointing out, all the biomarker data, all the key data sets that we are, um, pathology data, for example, in for cancer patients, uh, that would all be linked together as we are evolving into this rapidly. And that would, that would sort of solidify the real world data and the, and the confidence and the quality that we were and the completeness of the data that we were talking about earlier, that completeness would let us play with it more and, and develop the insight that would be extremely useful for all different stakeholders. Thank you, Ravinder. Bernard, your elevator uh, futurist lens of the world. Well, I would say I can, I can pursue what Ravinder was saying a few seconds away. You can imagine that, um, the ability for every part of the organization that produces data or needs data to be able to work in, in, in one environment, a, a, call it a platform, where you can do what you have to do, but you can also benefit from the data coming from other sources. For instance, I'll take one example on safety. If you take the data from toxicology, the, the pharmacovigilance data, the real world data, and you combine them, Every team will continue to do what they're supposed to do from different angles, but each of them would benefit from the access to a, a very different set of data that could be extremely powerful combined together to answer questions at all stage of the life of the product. So I think it's the way of working that I think we'll be seeing the bigger difference internally and also with the external world. Thank you, Bernard. Krish, your perspective? Yeah, I, I think the, the view is clear. There's no turning back. There's going to be increasing use of real-world data. Um, patient trials are going to be less burdensome, hopefully, and uh, shorter. We're going to accelerate uh, how we develop new medicines. 
but still we have a lot of work to do. I think we can't mistake a clear view for a short distance and we still have a lot of work to do in curating, connecting and convincing a lot of the stakeholders. Thank you, Krish. Tiffany, I wanna give you the last word. What is your view of the future over the next five to 10 years? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm excited to hear the other opinions um, on that and, and I'm hopeful for those. And I also see, you know, tech enabled, we're going to be collecting more and more real world data, mobile health. Um, with that, I think that privacy regulations are going to have to evolve as well. These new generations are very willing to be sharing lots of information about themselves at times. So I think that's going to be an area that's going to get some focus. Um, and, and things like virtual trials, right? I mean, that was accelerated by COVID. Um, but I, I do think that's going to be a way of the future. So that's what I expect. What I hope for is shortened development of cycles. Um, I hope that real world data can become necessary and sufficient at some point where it can be evidence of causality and not just association. We started this by talking a bit about patient journey and we've come back in a full cycle to making sure that our uses of real world data are aligned to the purpose, intent, and permissions, and desires of the patients we're looking to serve. And I think that's a, a great lens to wrap things up. I would like to thank our fabulous panelists for sharing your time with us today, and thank the audience for joining us and sharing your questions and perspectives. Thank you to Indigene for bringing us all together. Thank you.